Hello, my name is Dahlia Joseph, orthopedic nurse practitioner here at Baltimore Washington Medical Center. Thank you for joining us for the spine education class. This class serves as an information session for your upcoming cervical spine surgery. It will guide you through how to prepare for your surgery, what to expect on the day of surgery, what to expect while you're here in the hospital after your surgery, and what to expect after discharge from the hospital. You will have the best possible care to help you recover as soon as possible after your surgery. This includes enhanced recovery after surgery protocols, which are called ERAS protocols. These protocols include cleaning your skin with a special germ killing product, drinking specific carbohydrate containing liquids within two to four hours of your surgery, multiple pain control methods, preoperative strategies to decrease nausea after surgery, and walking as soon as possible after your surgery. You will need to select a family or friend to serve as your coach or care partner once you've had your procedure. This person will provide support and help you to reduce your anxiety. They'll attend each education and therapy session prior to discharge. They'll take part in planning for you to leave the hospital. They'll transport you to home because you cannot drive yourself home after surgery. They will also provide you with assistance when you're at home, especially within the first week after you've had your procedure. They will encourage you during exercise sessions at home when you feel unmotivated. And they will provide you with transportation to your follow-up appointments and to your physical therapy appointments. We also ask you to complete medical clearance before your surgery. There are some things that I will highlight which will need to be done within 30 days before your surgery. We would like you to see your primary care provider for a physical examination prior to your surgery. You will have tests such as blood work, EKG, and a COVID-19 test. In some cases, you may have a type and screen, which is a blood test. You might have an x-ray or an MRSA screening of your nose to determine your stability for the procedure. You may be told to stop or start some medications before surgery. Dental clearance is requested if you are having any oral symptoms such as toothaches, bleeding gums, mouth sores, and so on. At this time, you need to be in touch with your insurance company to discuss options for rehabilitation if they will be needed after your surgery. We ask that you see your specialist, meaning heart doctor or cardiologist, kidney doctor or nephrologist, lung doctor or pulmonologist, or any other specialist that you may have prior to your procedure. You will also meet with the anesthesiologist on the morning of surgery. You will not need to make an additional appointment to see the anesthesiologist before your day of surgery. Appointments for any type and screen testing or COVID-19 testing will be arranged for you at the hospital if needed. We ask you to do a special skin preparation prior to your surgery. This will reduce your chance for infections. We ask that you use Hibiclens with every shower starting the evening before surgery and on the morning of surgery, typically a minimum of two showers. Do not shave for two days prior to your procedure. The shower instructions for a HIPAA cleanse includes using your normal hair care and face care routine and then applying HIPAA cleanse from the neck down. Do not use the HIPAA cleanse near your eyes, ears, or genitals. Wash gently for five minutes using about two ounces for your entire body. Rinse well, dry with a clean towel, do not use lotions, perfume, or aftershave. Put on fresh, clean clothes after each shower with the Hibiclens. If you are using Hibiclens wipes, please follow the instructions on the packaging.
it is very important that you tell your surgeon if there is any change in your condition, meaning illnesses or injuries, prior to your surgery, especially in the days leading up to your surgery. Eating and drinking before surgery. Do not eat any solid foods after midnight, the night before your surgery. If you do not have diabetes, we ask that you drink 10 ounces of clear carbohydrate beverages. That means liquids that you are able to see through at bedtime and two hours before your surgery as well. Examples of clear liquids are listed below. Water is considered a clear liquid. However, it does not contain carbohydrate. So most people will go for the Gatorade option. If you are having Gatorade, we would prefer that you do not have red or purple as those can be misrepresented as blood. We ask that you have clear sodas, no colas, meaning Coke or Pepsi. You are able to have gelatin or popsicles or juices, but they should not contain any fruit particles or pulp and no cream. You are allowed to have coffee and tea. You are allowed to have sugar, but no cream in those beverages. If you do have diabetes or problems with digestion, such as gastroparesis, you should drink that carbohydrate drink four hours before your scheduled surgery time. What to bring to the hospital? The education handbook that you received from your surgeon's office, list of your current medications, prescription medications, non-prescription medications, and any supplements you may have started on your own. Include on this list how much of the medications you take and how often you take each. You should also bring a list of your allergies, including the reactions to each allergen. You should bring your photo ID, insurance card, and prescription card. You should bring clothes, including a button-up shirt and tennis shoes. Do not bring sandals as they can be a fall risk. Bring books, puzzles, if you think you might need them to entertain you while you're here. And if you have sleep apnea, please bring your CPAP machine to the hospital as you will need it for use when you're sleeping. If you've been prescribed a neck brace, bring that neck brace with you for use while you're here in the hospital. If you have possession of your MRI results or CAT scan results in the form of a disc, please bring it with you when you come to the hospital. Please keep all your valuables at home as we would not want those to be displaced because they can be difficult to replace. Day of surgery instructions. We ask that you arrive three hours prior to surgery if your surgery is 10 a.m. or after. If your surgery is before 10 a.m., we ask that you arrive two hours before your scheduled surgical time. When you arrive here at the hospital, please check in at the main lobby. Masks will be required now that we are in the COVID-19 era. The front desk staff will direct you to the admitting department, and from there, you will be directed to the surgery center. In the surgery center, there is a patient tracking system that's used. Once you've signed in, you will be assigned a number for privacy purposes that will be used to track where you are within the surgical suite. The screen has four columns which indicate the areas of the suite where you may be at any given time. The care partner that accompanies you to surgery will be able to look in each column to determine where you are at any given time. If you are unable to track the number adequately, the receptionist will be able to provide updates and will assist you with that process. Once you are in the pre-anesthesia area, the nursing staff will provide you care to reduce the risk of infection. They will clip any areas that need to be clipped. They will Again, complete a Hibiclens antimicrobial scrub. They will start IV fluids. If additional blood work is needed, they will perform the, that blood work. 
If there are prescribed medications, those will be given at that time and any screening for existing infections. You will receive a visit by the operating room team members. The team members are listed below. Anesthesia. Your anesthesiologist will discuss your options and recommendations for you. At this time, tell him or her of any past experience you have had with pain medications or anesthesia that might impact your experience. This surgery is usually done under general anesthesia. You will be put to sleep with medications through an IV line, and you will have a breathing tube in place that delivers oxygen and anesthetic gas to you throughout the procedure. Surgery time. The length of the surgery will depend on if the surgery is done from the front or an approach in the back. An ACDF or anterior cervical decompression infusion will take approximately two to three hours. A posterior cervical fusion, which is in the back, takes approximately two to four hours. What's wrong with my neck? This is a set of x-rays that shows different pictures or views of your neck. The first slide shows a healthy cervical spine and the second slide shows that there is an abnormality with the bones. As you can see, they are not crisply shaped as in the first slide. In the third slide, it shows fixation of those bones with hardware in place from the front. And in the fourth slide, it shows fixation of the abnormalities in the back where there is a posterior cervical fusion. The post-anesthesia care unit, PACU or recovery room. You will spend some time in the PACU after surgery. This is where you will wake up and the nurse can monitor your vital signs and pain after your surgery. Visitation is usually restricted in the PACU. You will be under careful observation for about two to six hours before going to the orthopedic unit. It is very important to tell your nurse about any pain or any nausea that you may have. Your hospital stay, if you are admitted to the orthopedic floor, is usually overnight. And in some cases, very rare cases, it may be two days. The orthopedic floor is located on 5 West. It contains all private rooms. And due to COVID-19, there are some changes that have been made to visitation, which will be gone over with you upon your arrival to the hospital on the morning of surgery. There is complimentary Wi-Fi available in the event you do need to use your electronics while you're here in the hospital. Wound expectations after surgery. These are usually surgeon specific. Your wound will be closed with glue, absorbable internal sutures and stary strips if the approach is done from the front as in an anterior cervical decompression infusion or ACDF. It will have staples if it is done from a posterior approach which is in the back. You will have a neck brace or a cervical soft collar in place. In some cases, there will be a wound drain in place as well. There are some factors that would prevent you from being discharged in a timely fashion, meaning they could affect your length of stay. Some of these factors are not meeting your goals for recovery and your goals for physical therapy, the inability to swallow, having a high drain output when measured, and any other medical issues, whether they're pre-existing or they're unforeseen. These are some of the common post-operative complaints after a cervical surgery. Difficulty swallowing. For that, we usually would recommend soft foods, cool liquids, the use of lozenges or throat sprays, for example, chloroseptic. Headaches. We typically will do over-the-counter medications such as Tylenol, we ask that you use a cool compress and that you get lots of rest.
Muscle spasms and pain in the upper back and shoulders are very typical at following the cervical spine surgery. You can take your medications as prescribed and change your position for comfort. Urinary retention is one of the things that we typically will see and the placement of a urinary catheter to keep the bladder empty for 24 to 48 hours is the first way that we combat this complication. Constipation. This happens frequently as well. Frequent walking, increasing your fluid intake and your fiber intake, and using stool softeners will offset these issues. The whiteboard is a communication tool that's located in each patient room. Its main intent is to provide information to both the care team and to the patient as well. Let's explore each section. The first section of the whiteboard asks for a name for the patient. What would you like to be called? Would you like to be called Mary or Mrs. Smith, for example? The care team is also listed the physician or surgeon's name, the nurse's name and phone number, the patient care technician and phone number, the charge nurse, the charge nurse's phone number, the physical therapist and their contact information, and we also include a family contact with their phone number. Under the essentials section, you will find items that might have been brought in with the patient when they came in for surgery. Some of these items would be dentures or glasses, hearing aids, and in some cases, prosthetic limbs. The reason we need to have this information is at discharge, we would like to ensure that these expensive and hard to replace items are going home with the patient and not misplaced. Under that section, we find that there is the yellow box. The yellow box specifically says, please call, don't fall. We are really strict about safety and we ask each patient to ensure that they are calling for help rather than to get out of bed or out of the chair and then inadvertently would fall. We like to be there just for assistance. In the pain management section, we do an assessment of the pain control and how it's being treated. For example, you'll be asked to rate your pain zero to 10, zero meaning no pain, 10 meaning the worst pain you've ever felt. We will put that number of your pain rating in this box next to the pain section. If you're medicated for that pain number, we will put the time of the medication in this box here. That will let us know if we walk into the room and we see that your pain was a six, you were medicated an hour ago, is that medication working, is it not working, when we reevaluate your pain. The care manager's phone number and name will be listed here as well, and that is the person that will assist you with any equipment needs at discharge. There is a message board which will enable you to leave messages for the staff or even for family members. Last but not least is your scorecard or report card. So this section deals with the physical and occupational therapy and physical activity. The activities are listed in the first column and you'll see examples of the activities as sitting to standing, out of bed, into bed, going to the bathroom, ambulation or walking, stair training, completing exercises, and daily living activities such as brushing your teeth and eating your meals. In the sections that follow from the left to the right, there is a scorecard of how you are performing these activities. It could be with maximum assistance, minimum assistance, standby, or self. Maximum assistance means that it, you are requiring the assistance of two people to complete each task in the activity section. Minimum assistance means that you are requiring the assistance of one person. Standby means that we are not doing anything physically to assist you, but we are present in the event you do need our assistance. And self means that you are completely independent with that particular activity. 
So once this activity is evaluated, a check mark will be placed under the appropriate column. And this will tell us, as well as you, how well you're doing. When all of your check marks are towards the standby and self areas, that will let you know that you are appropriate and ready for discharge. I mentioned in the previous slide that we ask you to rate your pain on a scale of zero to 10. Zero means no pain at all, and 10 means the worst pain you've ever felt. You will give us a number that corresponds to your pain level, and that will assist us with determining what pain management strategies we should use to control your pain. In some instances, we have patients who are unable to use the pain scale or they find it difficult. In those instances, we will use the face scale where you will identify what expression on the face is provided adequately shows what you're feeling. And there is a number assigned to that pain scale which will tell us or give us an idea of how bad your pain is or if it is well controlled. Examples of pain control. Patient controlled analgesia or PCA pumps. We very rarely or very seldom will use a PCA pump as a result of the side effects that patients can experience with the use of those pumps. Oral medications, that's the mode of choice that we use for delivering pain medications to patients. Pills such as oxycodone, Tylenol, Celebrex, or nerve pain medications are commonly used together in conjunction with each other to manage the different types of pain that we anticipate you'll feel based on the procedures that you've had. Ice therapy, whether by a cold pack or an ice wrap or a polar ice care machine will be used to help with soothing the pain, reducing the swelling, and helping you to move around easier. Potential side effects of pain medicine, itching, constipation or trouble, going to the bathroom for bowel movement, nausea and vomiting, or feeling sleepy. Those are very common side effects that we see. However, there are ways to combat those types of side effects. If they do become a problem, however, please tell your doctor so he or she may switch you to a different medication. There are some common questions that we receive regarding pain management and pain medication. One of the first questions we'll get most commonly is, do people get addicted to pain medication easily? The answer is no. The risk of getting addicted to pain medication that's prescribed and used appropriately in the way it was prescribed is less than 1%. Secondly, can pain medication really control the pain? The answer is yes. Many patients do have some pain after surgery, but medicine can keep the pain down so that you're able to move about comfortably. Thirdly, is it easier to put up with the pain than the side effects of the pain medication? That answer is a resounding no. Most common side effects can be easily treated. Your pain medication can be changed to meet the needs that you have for pain control. The CDC, Centers for Disease Control, has prescribing guidelines for acute pain we are recommended to prescribe short-acting opioids only using the lowest dosages and the recommendation is three days but no more than seven days. It's also recommending that we avoid the use of long-acting or extended release pain medications. If prescribed, they will only be used in the hospital setting and will be discontinued at discharge. The third recommendation is to ensure that non-opioid therapies are used to optimize pain control before starting the narcotic medication. Fourth, 
set realistic goals for pain and function based on the diagnosis and compare the results of treatment to the baseline of what you were feeling prior to the treatment. Discuss the benefits and the risks of all opiate medications. Avoid totals of greater than 90 morphine equivalents per day. And opioid medications will be used only temporarily to treat the post-operative pain. Chronic pain issues should be handled by a pain management provider. The goal of managing patients with chronic pain following surgery is not to get rid of the chronic pain. It is to allow the patients to return to their home doses of the medications that they were using for treatment prior to surgery. It is very important to realize that surgery will not take away chronic pain. Chronic pain management plan. It is very important that you develop a plan for pain control prior to your surgery day. Inpatient hospital providers will only be able to provide pain medications for seven days, and this is due to the pain guidelines from the CDC as we discussed in the previous slide. Notify your pain provider of your surgery date. Try to obtain a follow-up appointment within seven days of discharge in the event you need a refill on the pain medication, as this will not be able to be provided by the inpatient hospital provider. If your appointment is more than seven days, you may have a lapse in your pain management plan and you may be without medication. So it is very vital that you contact your chronic pain provider to get that appointment scheduled at that seven day mark. If you are discharged from your pain management provider prior to your procedure, you should notify the surgeon's office and schedule a post-operative appointment with a new pain provider for seven days after discharge. This should be done before your surgery day. If you are unable to obtain an appointment with a pain provider prior to your surgery, you will be provided with a list of pain providers and asked to make that appointment while you're here in the hospital. Patient responsibility. Never take opioids in higher amounts or more often than prescribed. If pain is not resolved with the prescribed dose, Contact your pain provider and schedule an appointment. Do not combine opioids with alcohol or other drugs that cause drowsiness. For example, muscle relaxants, sleep aids, or anxiety medications. Never sell or share prescription opioids. Store opioids in a secure place and out of the reach of others. If you have opioids remaining after treatment, Find your community take back program or follow instructions from the FDA website. The FDA website is listed below. With any surgery, there can be an increased risk of blood clots, which we try to keep from happening. We do this mainly by mechanical means using exercises, foot pumps, compression stockings, or sequential compression devices. The foot pumps is just the motion of moving the foot as if you are stepping on the brake and the gas. The compression stockings or the tight white stockings that can be knee high or thigh high and they are worn 12 out of 24 hours and you continue to wear them at discharge until your follow-up visit. You do not need to sleep in the stockings. The sequential compression devices that is a machine that's used only while you're hospitalized. It is plugged into the wall and it's usually found at the end of your bed. It has tubing that leads to wraps that are placed around your legs. When it's turned on, the air will circulate and puff the wraps up as if in a squeezing motion to allow blood flow from your legs. Pneumonia. Prevention of pneumonia is very important. Many people can have breathing problems or infections after surgery. The exercise of using an incentive spirometer can help to prevent that. 
The incentive spirometer is a hard plastic piece of equipment that has a tube that you place in between your lips and you take deep breaths in to exercise your lungs. So in and exhale. We ask that you do that five to 10 times an hour to keep your lungs inflated. We have since discussed preparing for the surgery. We've discussed the day of surgery and we've discussed the hospital stay. So at this point, we'll move on to the discharge planning. You are ready to go home, usually, when your vital signs are stable, your pain is adequately controlled, you can eat food, drink water, and take your medications by mouth, you can get in and out of bed, you can walk up and down stairs, you are able to walk to the bathroom and urinate by yourself, your drain, if you do have one, the output is low, and we've discontinued the drain. You can dress yourself, you can get in and out of the car, and you and your coach or care partner have finished training. Upon discharge from the hospital, you will receive discharge paperwork as well as prescriptions. The prescriptions that need to be filled in your pharmacy will be sent to your pharmacy electronically. The medications that will be over the counter that are prescribed at discharge will be given to you on a prescription sheet, which will help you to know exactly what medication you should pick up over the counter and how to take that medication. All the instructions will be included on that physical prescription sheet. A follow-up call will be placed to you at home once you have been discharged. Usually that call will come in within 48 hours of you going home. At that time, we would like to determine that your pain is remaining controlled. You were able to obtain all of the medications that were prescribed for you. Your appointments have been set for physical therapy as well as your follow-up and that you are generally doing well overall. Returning to daily activities. Restrictions after your neck surgery, wear the neck brace or the cervical collar whenever you are outside of the house, especially when you are riding in a car. No lifting of items greater than 10 pounds. Dressing and wound care options are usually surgeon specific. Some surgeons will require you to remove the dressing after three days. Do not reapply the dressing. Stary strips will fall off on their own. Do not remove them. There are other surgeons who will specify, do not remove the dressing. It will be removed at the follow-up visit with your surgeon. Showering options are also surgeon specific. There are surgeons that will say no showering until your follow-up visit, and there are others who will say shower after three days when the dressing has been removed. When should you call your physician? If you are experiencing any medication side effects such as nausea, vomiting, constipation, or pain that is not relieved by medicine, and they become unbearable, if you should experience any redness, tenderness or swelling in the tissues around your surgery cut with persistent fevers greater than 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit, fluid coming out of your incision that looks like pus or smells bad, you should notify your surgeon right away. We ask that you check your surgical area daily for any signs of the infections or increased swelling that were mentioned above. If you do experience a sudden inability to swallow, that is considered a medical emergency. Please call 911 right away. The follow-up visit in your surgeon's office is approximately one to two weeks after discharge, and of course, this is surgeon-specific. We recommend that you make that appointment before your surgery date or on the day of discharge from the hospital. When you go to that appointment, we ask you to bring a complete list of all the medications that you're currently taking, a list of questions or concerns that you might need answered or addressed by the surgeon, and bear in mind that an x-ray may be taken at that visit. So 
reduce or minimize the amount of metal that might be on your body. For example, jewelry, big belt buckles, and so on. These are the numbers for the nursing supervisor, Five West Orthopedic Unit, and the COVID-19 testing area. Just in the event, you should need these numbers while you're preparing for your surgery. Our goal is to get you back to the activities and lifestyle that you are used to and to do so as quickly and safely as possible. Thank you for choosing us for your cervical spine surgery. We truly appreciate your vote of confidence. We will do our very best to ensure that you will have a safe and pleasant experience.